Yay! Yay! I was ready. You were you were on <laughs> it. Uh, what is up, everyone? Welcome to Ginger Runner Live, episode number two hundred and seventy-one. We are up there. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh huh. I'm ex- I'm excited about tonight's episode because we get to bring on a guest. He's local to the Pacific Northwest, but his name needs to be known around the world if it isn't already. Totally. Yeah. He's one of the guys that uh, we talked. Actually, we, I feel like we actually talk about him on the show more than he knows. Uh, but we often mention his name because he is a local adventurer here in the Pacific Northwest, but has also done some really big, incredible things over the years. And and we've just been following his journey and his runs and his adventures and are constantly inspired by what this guy does uh, on the trail and off the trail. He's a dad. He's a really hard worker, full time job, but manages to balance family adventure uh, races and everything. Gavin Woody is joining us on the show tonight. And I, what I was going to mention was that last week we had. Uh, our two guests, Caitlin and Alex, talk about the Mount Rainier Infinity Loop. Yes. And Gavin, with his partner, Roz, or I believe the first to do the Infinity Loop a couple of years back. Um, we'll talk to him a little bit about that just to sort of like connect those last two shows together. This one and last week's show. But there's so much more to talk about. I was talking uh, with Gavin before the show, and I was like, there's so much to cover. And he's like, mm-hmm. that's cool, man. Whatever you want to talk about. I'm like, okay, get ready. Everything. It's going to be talk everything. About everything. So sit back, <laughs> relax, everyone. Welcome to Ginger Runner Live, episode number 271 with Gavin Woody. Begins now. Ginger Runner. Yay! Yay. <laughs> hey, everyone. Welcome to Ginger Runner Live, episode number 271. I am your host, Ethan. Hi, Ethan. <laughs> I am your co-host, Kim. <laughs> well, no, you're you're a host. You don't have to be co-host. All right, all right. You're, you're my host. co-host. Mm-hmm. You're my assistant. Uh, we appreciate you spending <laughs> some time with us on these Monday nights, taking some time out of your busy schedules. Uh, and tonight's episode is going to be really fun because we get to talk to probably one of the most seasoned adventurers we get on this show. He he's done everything from the uh, the Barkley marathons he's attempted, uh, Big's Backyard Ultra. Uh, Dragon's back in the UK. I mean, I could literally list off 20 different races that would destroy any regular human. Yeah. Uh, but Basically this guy's think done. of all the hard, like the hardest races you can think about. The hardest foot races <laughs> out there, adventure races and everything. Uh, we had him on a long time ago, actually, talking about a race, I believe, that took place in New Zealand. God, it's been that long. We also had him on talking about Dragon's back. Oh, this guy is badass. Gavin Woody is on the show tonight, and he's going to talk to us all about What's been going on recently? So he's trained. He raced Barkley this year, attempted it for, I believe, his first time. We can talk to him a little bit about that. What it's like balancing fatherhood and adventure and being a family guy, a full-time war- employee, and just balancing all of that. I don't know if Gavin knows how much we actually talk, talk about, about him. Talk about him in a regular, yes. everyday life. Like Anytime we see like children or parents trying to juggle things, we always bring up Gavin. Gavin can do it. <laughs> Uh, we're out Gavin in the trails. Gavin just ran for four days, and now he's at his daughter's <laughs> birthday party. <laughs> uh, so he's been training a lot. We've been following his adventures and stuff on social media and seeing the the lines and the routes he's doing. He recently completed this huge epic line in the Cascades that he just sort of created. Uh, and during that, there was a, a pretty unfortunate accident. Um, everyone at this point is okay and, and has been uh, evacuated off the mountains and stuff like that. But I do want to talk to Gavin since he is so experienced on backcountry preparedness, safety, things that you can carry with you, you know, the 10 essentials. How can you go out into the backcountry and be prepared for these things that can happen? Because it can happen to anybody, including some of the best, like Gavin. Uh, and he, on a whim, decided to run Fat Dog 120 this last weekend. So we have a lot to talk about today. <laughs> no big deal. It's like <laughs> no one of the deal. toughest races in Canada. No big deal. <laughs> uh, so again, we are live. Gavin, w- we'll introduce him in just a second here. And if you are watching live, jump into the chat room. Kim, you're in there. You busted me drinking, taking a drink of beer. Yes, I am in the chat room. We are live. We have our wonderful guest Gavin here with us. So if you guys have questions, pop them into the chat room. Yes. Before we introduce our wonderful guest tonight, we do have some individuals that we like to thank at the top of every Ginger Runner Live, and those are our Patreon supporters. They are the reason that we're able to do this podcast every Monday, now for five and a half years. Uh, We're able to do reviews, films, projects, runs, all sorts of things, and because of them, that we're able to do all of this. So 
A shout out to our Patreon crew at patreon.com slash the ginger runner. Three individuals in particular at that top tier. Mr. Brian Sands, he's been a longtime supporter, super inspirational story, lost over 100 pounds, ran his first marathon, first 50K. He is, I believe, in Squamish now or in Vancouver. I think Vancouver. he's in Vancouver prepping to like crush the Squamish, Squamish 50K 50. this weekend. Yeah. Uh, so big shout out Sorry. to Brian and, and it's going to be a pretty awesome week for him prepping for the 50K. Coming and like a weekend, huge GR crew contingency is going to be there as well. Which is also really great out there supporting, running, cheering, all that good stuff. Uh, Chris Lee in Hong Kong. Big shout out to Chris. Uh, he organizes a company, an organization called Trailblazer. They showcase all the trails that are in the Hong Kong region. Uh, and special shout out to him because I know that there's a lot of stuff happening right now in Hong Kong. And uh, Chris and his family are safe and everything like that. But I just want to give him a special shout out because he's been incredibly supportive of everything we're doing throughout all of this, yes. uh, which is just, it's amazing that he's able to balance and juggle everything there as well. And finally, Rick Bjarnison and his team at CheekyMonkeyMedia.ca. They're a web design company. They redid the GingerRunner.com website. So big shout out to Rick and his team. Rick is also an ultra runner, just crushed the Sinister 7. Uh, it was really great to find out what it was like to run that race. It sounds like it's awful, like <laughs> really difficult, really great race, but really awful because it really just tears everyone apart. Uh, in the best ways possible. So shout out to Rick and his team at Cheeky Monkey Media. Now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our guest. <laughs> the, the, the way I've set that up, not work. <laughs> you what? It was perfect. It was perfect? Yeah. Okay, good. Without further ado, our wonderful guest tonight comes to us from maybe a half mile away. <laughs> like, honestly, but uh, he's a full-time adventurer, full-time uh, 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 employee, <laughs> but also a father and like manages to juggle it all. We're going to talk to him about as much of it as we can in tonight's hour. Gavin Woody is back on the show. Yay. Yay. How all are right. you, my friend? Awesome. Thanks. Thanks for having me guys. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned it a little bit before the show, but you are on a bit of a roll right now with a um, lack of sleep or has it just been a lot of travel, a lot of adventure? How far back has this stretch of uh, work gone? Like, when's the last time you slept? <laughs> <laughs> good sleep. Uh, well, actually, I got pretty good sleep last, I guess, not this past weekend, but the weekend before in um, at Beacon Rock at the 50K. I always sleep really well when we camp. And oh, so yeah. We were, out, we were down there doing the 50K, which is a great, great race. And um, so I uh, enjoyed some beers after that thing. Uh, as well as the water slide, so uh, <laughs> so James and Rain Shadow running, they do an they put on an awesome race there. Anyway, I always sleep great in a sleeping bag. But I like it's like my last good sleep was not last weekend, but the weekend before. But the weekend before that, <laughs> yeah, this I, past weekend was not very good sleep. Right, because you just ran Fat Dog. Yeah, is that your first time attempting that event? Yeah, I was gonna go out there uh, two years ago, and um, I'd been injured and I was trying to get ready. I was going to use it for, as a training run for Moab 240 mm -hmm. and just decided it wasn't a good idea to do it. So I volunteered instead. And I think I cooked like 32 pounds of bacon or something, which was, which was just also for yourself. An, an, an endurance <laughs> event. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, uh, uh, so anyway, so got, you know, got to see a little bit of kind of the course and just how big the mountains are. And then yeah. last year, uh, was supposed to do it and my sister we were going to run it together but then it was canceled due to wildfires so right. instead we we ran the um we fast packed the uh section j snow call me to stevens 70 ish miles which was turned out to be awesome a great sure. adventure for us to do together but uh yeah i jumped in on this just at the last minute um because i uh, couldn't do the original plan for the weekend which i can get into yeah i like, I know I want to jump into Fat Dog right away because it is obviously the race that just occurred and uh, it looked incredible this year. I know they had to reroute some stuff, but we'll talk about that a little bit um, in a little bit because I want to kind of backtrack. Since last time we've had you on the show, you've been up to some serious training and races. Uh, I mentioned it a little bit in the pre-show, but I there was one night that both Kim and I, you know, were kind of prepping for Barkley coverage and getting ready to kind of follow our friends out there and there's a lot of anticipation to that event specifically across the globe, but we noticed that you were gearing up your mileage in a very specific way. And I was like, I wonder if, I wonder if Gavin's <laughs> actually going to do it. Cause after Big's backyard, you did so well at Big's backyard against just some badass athletes. Um, 
there was one night, or I guess oh. a couple days, where yes. <laughs> Gavin, for those of you who might be familiar with the region on Tiger Mountain, there's a trail called uh, Cable Line. How many repeats of Cable Line did you end up doing? <laughs> yeah, so it's a 2,000 foot climb, and it's a nice, you know, pretty steep trail. And so ended up doing 15 repeats on it <sighs> in like yes. a, 24 hours or something. Did you get weather during that? I'm trying to remember uh, what the... I don't remember, but it was snow for about half of it. Yes, so there was snow about halfway was. up. So I had to, I had to, <laughs> I was using um, kind of micro spike stuff. Um, and what was even cooler, well, here's what I really love about where we live is Literally, so after I did that and just, you know, 30,000 feet of climbing, it's, it, you know, took its toll. But literally a couple of days later, it dropped some new snow on Tiger. And um, so I uh, went up there one morning and uh, skied off the, off the top. Like the first, <laughs> right. the first like 500 feet were good. The next like, I don't know, 300 feet were survival skiing. But yeah, it was pretty awesome. So, you know, to run it and then to ski off of it was pretty special. We definitely saw. We saw your ski tracks. Ski tracks. Because <laughs> <laughs> we were prepping for Tiger Claw at this time, so we were running right. every trail of our course. We were doing a lot of recon. A lot that of time. recon, <laughs> and we we watched overnight as you were tagging summits, and we're like, "Oh my god, he's still going!" Like the next morning, we're having breakfast. We're gonna head out there, and you're like wrapping up your fifteenth summit. Uh, but the snow on that mountain it was rare to see so much snow over yep. such a short period of time and have it last so long. But we were out there a couple of days after your ski off the summit. And I we I swear we came across your tracks ducking through trees. I was like, oh, this is Gavin. This That's is definitely funny. Gavin. So it's pretty funny. But how did Barkley go? <laughs> well, it was it was super hard. I mean, it was mm. it lived up to all of, you know, what uh, I mean, you know, you see the movies and hear the stories, but the terrain is just so steep and, um, you know, I thought I'd done a lot of vert, but I need to do more in the wow. future if I, you know, I mean, just to give, put it in perspective, right. So, you know, I'm not, I won't go into all the details. I mean, people, you know, there's a lot of info out, uh, out about Barkley, but, um, the, the, to put it in perspective, you know, 40 people, you know, get into this thing and, you know, I tried for six years to get in. Right. So, I mean, these are well prepared, you know, people um, and it's five loops and only half of us started a second loop. Right. Just to put that in perspective, it's like it's, it's kind of wild. Yeah. So, crazy. So anyway, for me, so I mean, the short story is, which is kind of ironic because I consider myself to be good in adverse weather conditions, sure. but it was ultimately the weather that got me. So I started my second loop after being, it was a warm day. It was humid. I was sweating like crazy. Actually had dialed in the navigation really well. So that was the thing I was kind of worried about because it's right. one thing to know like, Hey, I'm like on top of this mountain. It's another thing like, Oh, the, you know, the fallen tree that points, you know, to the North that the, you know, there's a rock and you got to find the book underneath this thing. So just like the micro nav i was really worried about but it turned out to be i was i was really dialed on that which was oh. which was confidence boosting but what happened was on the second loop going out we i knew weather was going to come in but i thought oh well i was so warm during the day i'll be pushing hard and so i'll, I'll i took my lightweight rain gear essentially my lightweight gear and it just wasn't sufficient and so i got i forget how many books in probably like four or something and, um, and I was like, this is not safe. Cause I knew the next, where I was going next was right. going to be super remote. I would drop down into kind of a, an area where, you know, it was very committing and, uh, it was a hard decision for sure. But I was just, you know, I mean, and my thing is like, I'm just out here to, you know, have fun and I just want to like get back and see my family. And so it was, uh, it was a tough decision, but it was the right one. It you know, I, I have followed you for a long time and I, I know the sort of things that you do. And anytime, uh, anytime I see you start an adventure, I'm like, well, it's guaranteed if Gavin's doing something right now, like you just did a big line through the cascades. I'm like, this is going to be a stout adventure. Like I look at you as someone who can handle pretty much the worst of the worst and grin and bear it and get through it. So for you to, to, 
talk about the weather in that way and that you felt you were going to enter an area that could potentially lead to an unsafe environment for yourself. That's just a testament to right. how crazy it was out there right. this year uh, and the weather. Because, yeah, I, I look at Gavin as kind of that like ultimate badass. <laughs> Hi, so, I know you. you're here well, on the show, but I, 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 well, it's okay you. that I said that. No, I um, appreciate that. Go ahead, Kim. Is it something that you want to attempt again? Yeah. Oh, I'd love to. Yeah, I mean, it was just, I mean, the whole experience was just, it's just, it's so, um, uh, it just feels like family, you know, just people. And I got to see Guillaume and um, Johan from, from Biggs, Biggs. And it's just yeah. like these, you know, awesome people and got to, you know, spend time with Jamil and kind of all these other folks who, you know, you kind of see online and, um, and then it's just, it's a very family feel, you know, Laz is just, he's just a great guy. His wife, Sandra is just hilarious. So anyway, it, I, I just love that community feel. Um, and yeah, I'd love to go try to tackle it again, but, but honestly, it's like the vert is, it's so much, it's just so steep and so hard. Like, It'll be interesting to see, like, can anybody finish it, right? I mean, that's what Laz wants to do is just put it right on that edge of, of in, in human capability. And, um, you know, Carl, the dentist from uh, Denmark, I think I got that right, you know, to put it in perspective. So he, only two people, he and this other guy, Greg, started, they finished, to, they started a fourth loop. And, they, and you have to fin start a fourth loop under 36 hours. They started in like 35 or yeah, 35, 59 or something. Minutes, right. Or seconds. I mean, just like sec, I mean, right before the cutoff. So really they had no hope of completing be, be just because it was, you know, they finished the first loop in like an eight hours or something. So, but just the fact that they went out was like super impressive just to like go. Well, they found Greg, Greg and Carl found the first book and um, then Greg turned around and Carl kept going. Now, Carl, he set the Appalachian speed record, right? Took 20% off the last time, like took something crazy off, right? I mean, this oh, dude is, a, is an animal. And um, so he gets out there and he'd just been at, the, at that second book, you know, what, 12 hours before or whatever, descended into this valley, couldn't find it, spent like four hours looking for it, came back home. You know, it's just like, it's just so insane, <laughs> which is what makes it cool. So right. that's a long way of saying, I'd love to go back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Blast you know, me in. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll make the phone call. We'll call him, let him know, uh, let Gavin back in. Uh, it's one of those things that, you know, since we started going and filming Gary and, and following everything that happens there and, and knowing more and more of the people that participate and stuff, it it is always fascinating to see who shows up year after year and the people who continue on knowing that they won't have any hope of finishing, but they they'll start that extra loop because they want that experience on the course and they want right. to see things just that additional six hours. They want to see it. It's just, it's such a testament to the athletes that even attempt that thing. Um, so many of them know that I might even, I might not make a first loop. I might not do one loop, but my goal is to go out there and see and do as much of it as possible and enjoy it. And, and just the amount of preparation, preparation. that goes in and dedication to go yeah. into something like that, right? Yeah, and he so. keeps changing, right? He keeps <laughs> adding those things that make it just more difficult. And so athletes show up just underprepared. <laughs> um, and for you to say that you need more vert training is like, wait, <laughs> wait, wait, what? <laughs> I'm like, wasn't that enough? That's crazy. <laughs> I want to kind of push ahead because that happened a couple of months ago, obviously. But in the last few months, you've you've been training uh, leading up towards this towards Bigfoot because Bigfoot 200 took place this weekend. Or I guess is it still technically taking place? I think it is. I think it is. I think it is because I think it started Friday still, morning and it's four days. So it is still taking place. What were you uh, what have you been building up for? Um, I know that your sister was involved in this as well. What was she building up for? And, and sort of let's let's kind of set the stage as to as to what occurred in the last couple of weeks. Yeah. So I normally just kind of like to do stuff and then talk about what I've done. Um, as, but I'll just tell you, I'm, I'm going out to uh, PTL um, in, you know, uh, well, we're flying to Paris uh, 
Saturday. We still have not booked any, literally no hotels, no <laughs> travel plans at all. So anyway, sounds Sarah, like us that sounds like us. <laughs> yeah, I, we've gotten very complacent around the, the travel thing. But, but anyway, Sarah and I are going to go spend a week in Paris, which will be nice to be together and spend some time um, just cruising around. And then I'm going to fly to Geneva and then head to Chamonix to do take part in PTL, which is Petit uh, Trotte Lyon, which is a, the long version of UTMB. <laughs> and so it's, uh, it's a, they change the course every year, but it's 200 miles, some crazy 70 or 80,000 feet of climbing. But the, but the, in, which I did, uh, uh, Torta Jaunts, which is in Northern Italy, a big, uh, 200 mile loop, 80,000 feet of climbing. I did that a number of years ago. So it's kind of like that, but no marked trail. And so you have to find your way between these different checkpoints and you have to have a, a team of two or three people. And so mm. a guy that I ran a lot of the spine race with a couple of years ago, a guy named Mark Turner, he and I are going to go out and, and attempt this thing. But the other added complexity is the technicality of the route. So there's a helmet and harness and via fraud, excuse me, via fraud gear as required wow. gear as part of this. So it's going to be pretty intense. Well, you have drop points so you can drop via Ferrata gear specifically from point to point or do you have to carry it the entire time we don't know yet wow so hopefully we'll be able to i mean it's it's actually pretty lightweight stuff so mm. i'm just used to carrying a lot of a lot of gear so but yeah so anyway so i've been i've been wanting to do wanting to do ptl since i did utmb like gosh seven years ago because you know here we all are with you know our fairly lightweight backpacks and you see, you know, starting UTMB and, and before the PTL guys had started with, you know, these bigger packs and just look like, like, oh my gosh, that looks pretty serious. So, uh, so yeah, I'm stoked to go out there. So yeah, so this was all, this has all been kind of a build up for that. Hmm. And, um, uh, so then what was going to happen this past weekend was my sister, Kirsten was going to. Uh, was going to uh, run Bigfoot 200 and I was going to pace her at that. Um, but then, you know, we can get in the story what happened, but I was still wanting to do a run. And so I had jumped into fat dog, which was probably stupid to actually run an actual race just a couple <laughs> weeks out. But, you know, I've wanted, yeah, that's just, so not the smartest guy in the world, but you know, at but, the same point, yeah. go ahead. I'm like, but you're Gavin, but you're <laughs> Gavin. And like, I wouldn't even consider it a race. It's probably just an experience with aid stations. Like, you know, yeah. knowing Gavin, it's like, oh, it's a 120 plus mile adventure with some aid stations in between, which I don't really need. Uh, <laughs> but it will be a fun experience in Epic Mountains. And it's kind of, you know, we'll get to that. I'm sure that's exactly what it was, if not more so. Uh, before we get into <clears throat> the cascade line that you just did and and the accident and everything like that, let's get to some live questions because I've I've been neglecting them. Kim has pulled a yeah. bunch of Sure. Great question from Nathaniel in the chat room. They ask, uh, Gavin, in an interview on the ultra running successes, you describe benefiting from the positive power of negative thinking. How do you turn negative thoughts into positive motivation? Yeah, I think I'm a pretty positive guy. Just generally, I just like to kind of think, um, you know, that and, and, and it kind of draw on past experiences you know, just say, Hey, I can get through this. But I think the whole negative thinking that, yeah. So the, the quote is Will Gadd, who's a, a famous ice climber is that, you know, the positive power of negative thinking, like what are all the things that are trying to kill me out here? Mm. And, you know, then to try to mitigate those risks. So, um, so yeah, so I, it's not like being negative as you're going through something, but just trying to assess like, where is there danger here? Where do I really need to pay attention? And then where are there, you know, where can I kind of, you know, not where I can kind of chill out a little bit. Um, so it's both during the activity and then, and, but a lot of it is beforehand trying to think, what are all the things that could go wrong? You know, is it the weather or is it going to be the route finding? Do I have a backup plan for navigation? You know, all of those things, because, you know, and this, you know, we'll get into the accident, but you know, it's like, you know, I see people moving like, you know, light and fast in the mountains. And, you know, even like this weekend with fat dog, like I saw people with these little tiny bags and I'm like, you know, that's great when it's sunny and it's warm and it's daytime, but you know, you twist an ankle or, you know, go off route, twist an ankle and you're miles away from an aid station. You know, what does that look like? 
And so, you know, everything's fine until it's not. Right. So, um, so anyway, that's what I think about is just trying to basically spend, if I had to spend the night out by myself, how am I going to be able to, you know, be okay? I think that's a great sort of detail into this conversation, uh, of your adventure in the Cascades. So you, did you create this line? Was it a, a set line that you've seen other people do before 60 plus miles, um, connecting peaks and stuff like that in the Cascades? Yeah, I was, I had a, this free weekend and I was, I just had penciled in my calendar, like long, you know, long run or something. And so, but in I, that would, like, a Gavin <laughs> long run. I'm like, I, Gavin, you're on your own, man. I appreciate the invite. But. <laughs> Yeah, so I just figured I had, you know, I had the time and I wanted to do something just that was different. And so I started looking at, well, where haven't I really spent time? And I thought, well, I haven't spent time in the Tiena way. And so I started looking at the Tiena way 100 route. Yeah. And so I kind of considered that. And then I started looking north of that and just north of the Tiena way are the enchantments. And, and I've always thought of those things very separate. Yeah. But they're actually, you can connect them, just not very easily, as I found out. And so I basically started getting on uh, Caltopo, and actually I was mapping out in Gaia. And uh, I just kind of was like, I wonder if I could do something in the enchantments and then get through the Alpine Lakes wilderness, which is uh, where, I mean, people, if you were looking at a map, you'd see you basically have the enchantments in the north, and then you have the Alpine Lakes wilderness, like a sliver. And then you have um, the Tiena Way. And they're very different environments. The, right. the enchantments, you know, these big rocky, craggy peaks. And then in the Alpine Lakes, it's very forested and, you know, very lush. And then the Tiena Way is very arid. So I thought it'd be cool to, like, could I piece all these three sections together and hit some of the iconic peaks along the way? And so the route that I drew up was basically starting and doing kind of a lot of people run the enchantments like this a through run, which yep. is which is great. And you go up this thing called Asgard Pass and you see Colchuk and, and, and Dragon Tail and these other big peaks. But I started looking and I was like, I wonder if I could and I wanted to scramble everything. Right. And so, you know, do some kind of because as part of PTL, there'll be a lot of scrambling. And so I thought it'd be good practice to just, you know, be on really uneven terrain. And so anyway, so what I pieced together was to basically start at the Stuart Lake trail, trailhead where people will start the enchantments through, through hike and then scramble up, go up a uh, Colchuk call and then hit Colchuk and then sneak uh, behind Dragon Tail, get up Dragon Tail, then traverse over to Little Annapurna and then scoot over to McClellan Peak and then drop off McClellan into the, uh, into the Alpine Lakes, to the wow. basically Ingalls Creek, and then climb back out into the Tiena Way, run, traverse across the Tiena Way, back to the Esmeralda Lake Trailhead. Then pick up my sister, because she wanted to do a, her last training run before Bigfoot 200. Right. And so then we would then ascend Mount Stewart, come back down, and then complete the loop by basically running out and around by, uh, and maybe getting to Cashmere Mountain as well to complete kind of a 60 to 70 mile loop around there. So that was the plan. So, she, so I would basically do half of it and pick up my sister. We'd go Stewart and then run back around back to my car. That, I mean, for those who are unfamiliar with the region, just sort of the description that Gavin's mm. giving here of this route, I mean, just, just the enchantments alone is, eight to 10,000 feet of gain, less than 20 miles. I mean, it's a stout day in and of itself. And you cross over, you start adding in stuff in the Alpine Lakes wilderness, uh, Mount Stewart, you're adding a lot it's more. It's big stuff. It's big like, stuff. Like I know Gavin used the term scoot on over too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just scoot on yeah. over to this peak. It's like, well, there's a lot more than just scooting. So there's a question from yeah. Randy in the chat room. Randy wants to know, um, do you need permits for adventures mm -hmm. like this? The nice thing about the enchantments is if you are not camping, you don't need a permit. Yeah, so so that's why it's gotten really popular with through through hikers because they can just, you know, do it in a day. So um and it's such a gorgeous area, especially in the you know, October time frame. You can 
you know, with the yeah. larches and everything. So it's really awesome. But yeah, it's like super impossible to get permits there. So this line uh, obviously sounds like perfect training for PTL. It also sounds like perfect training for Bigfoot. So you kind of have the best of both worlds here. You just talked about mitigating risk and, and sort of identifying the things that you can control or at least prepare for. For this run, do you prepare or bring anything different than what you would for a normal, like doing 15 repeats of cable line? Like, are you going out there with different gear? And are you preparing? Because it's a lot of a lot of it is full on backcountry, like the access is very limited. Uh, helicopter in in worst case scenario, obviously, uh, and it's deep. So what are you doing sort of as preparation for this knowing it's a long day, big route? What are you preparing? <laughs> Yeah, so I, f I figured, so I mean, ultimately, I mean, just put in perspective, I did 50 miles, but it was 26,000 feet of climbing. So that was, <laughs> that was a lot. And uh, so, you know, that's Are like, your quads cramping up just thinking about it? Yeah, I, uh, <laughs> I just bonked, uh, actually. That's right. It's crazy. You just describe yeah, it. Yeah. So, so I, so I knew, and because a lot of it was off trail, I knew it was going to take a long, long time. So I was ready to sleep. I just didn't know if I would or when, uh -huh. but I took, but really the only thing I took that was additive to what I would normally take out for a regular run was a very lightweight sleeping pad, like this little inflatable skeleton thing, which is, we, my wife and I joke about it. It's like, it's like, it's so light, you can barely feel that it's there sort of thing. <laughs> like, it's like kind of, yeah. yeah. Is so it doing anyway. anything? Yeah, right. <laughs> So anyway, so I had that, but I normally take puppy jacket, puffy pants, rain gear, some lightweight bivy sack. I mean, it's all super lightweight, you know, the lightest weight stuff out there, but, um, but I, I just like to carry it. It's just kind of peace of mind. I also, as part of this, had a helmet and crampons mm. because I was going to be on snow and I, and an ice axe. Uh, go ahead, Kim. Uh, Goseki NZ in the chat room wants to know if you carried a spot or personal locator beacon with you. I did, thankfully. So I have this thing called Somewhere. It is a, it was on a Kickstarter campaign and it's kind of like one of the small Garmin in reach things. So it's two, a two way text enabled and it, uh, and it was good because I used it to call in a rescue. That's exactly where I wanted to go next is because obviously you're very seasoned. You're very, aware, uh, prepared. prepared, you're obviously packing a lot of things that you know, you may never need. Uh, but in this case, you did, can you sort of set up what happened? You had picked up Kira, you, you how many miles did you guys run together at this point? And sort of what happened? Yeah, so, so we started at, I think, 8am. So I mean, just put in perspective, so I had started at 5am, okay. Saturday morning, I got around to go through the enchantments, Alpine Lakes, and then the Tiena Way. Um, I got back to the Esmeralda Trailhead at like 8 a.m. So what is that? 27 hours. So a day later, show up with here, which was hours later than I had expected, um, right. because getting off McClellan down this ridge, down this drainage was actually very scary because it. It was, it started off relatively smoothly and then got increasingly steep and turned into these series of these waterfalls, which I was really worried about committing to and going down, not being able to climb back out. So I was traversing back and forth on some really steep terrain, just trying to find a way out. And then once it got flat, then it was just like this heinous slide alder, which is, if you've ever been caught in it, you'll know. Because it took me like an hour to move like half a football field or something. Um, wow. It was just insan insanity. So it took longer than expected. So I, I also want to just point out that Gavin also has lots of photos and video. He has a video of this this waterfall section he's talking about where he literally just does a 360 and there, there's like nowhere to go on his Instagram. So you can kind of follow along as he's describing this. Uh, so you're coming down this drainage. You're getting through the fall yeah, before you so, yeah, up here. Yeah. So anyway, so finally got back around. And so the plan was to, again, ascend Mount Stewart and then come back down and then complete the loop to pick up my car. So anyway, so, so Kira and I, we, you know, load up or she loads up gear 
and um, and and just to also I'll talk about my sister. So she's a uh, she and her husband are have been out here the, for the past year. He's been doing a trauma surgery fellowship at Harborview, and my sister is in medical school at Harvard, but has been on her research here. So she's been out here and able to and do I mean be you know be a med student and sure. you know do a lot of just running and adventuring around. So she'd been she'd climbed Adams a few weeks or you know a month earlier and you know had been doing a lot of just adventuring out and we've climbed Rainier together before and Mount Baker and so she's experienced. She's very experienced she's yeah. Been, yeah, been been experienced in the mountains. <clears throat> and so we decided to climb Mount Stewart via the Cascadian Coolar, which is a you know semi technical route. I mean it doesn't require uh, technical gear, but there's some scrambling involved and it's just kind of notorious for just being kind of a lot of kitty litter, you know, on rock. And it's right. just, it's just, you know, people don't say nice things about the Cascadians, but it's also the descent route for the technical routes on the peak. So the West Ridge, which is low, kind of low fifth class. And then the North Ridge, which is a full on grade five, I think, climb. Um, uh, and so the, the, you know, experienced mountaineers tackle. So anyway, so that, but the Cascadian is the descent route. So anyway, so, so, um, so basically we ascended the Cascadian and as when we got up to a point where there's a permanent snow field and we were trying to decide, should we take the, the rocks on the left, which were just We'd heard they were sketchy and loose and just, you know, just dangerous, essentially, and, or take the snow. And we had taken, we had crampons and ice axes. And normally, I find that moving on snow is much more efficient than, you sure. know, going over scree and stuff. So we said, let's take the snow. And we began ascending the route, just switchbacking up the route. And I was in the lead initially and taking steps. And it was actually good snow. Um, not too soft and slushy where you're slipping out every turn and also, you know, not super rock hard. And so no need to belay, right? Like there's no, you're not roped in together. There's no, and nothing like that. No harnesses or anything. Right. We, yeah, no, no harnesses. So we we're just ascending, uh, ascending the route, but towards the, we've got, I mean, just within probably a few hundred feet of the very top of the snow and here had taken the lead and was making her her kind of second to last turn and uh something happened and she slipped uh tried to self arrest but slid down the mountain uh for a hundred feet and got kind of caught between a rock and the snow kind of this moat which caught her which was good because it, it stopped her her slide but in the process uh, uh, breaks her ankle um, got caught the cramp on either during the slide or once she um, got in to where the snow and rock was and um, and and so um, immediately you know she starts saying I think I broke my ankle think I broke my ankle I very cautiously descended down to her and um, and she was uh, there was blood everywhere so her ankle was um, was bleeding so we we're trying to assess the damage also, you know, trying to understand how bad this was. And we were in very steep terrain. So very steep snow or the other option was just really just nasty rock. And so she could not put weight on this foot. And so, um, I mean, I go through kind of second, but second, but at the end of the day, we called in, um, for a rescue and got her out of there. And she has now had surgery and is recovering. I, I mean, even as you're describing this, I can't imagine as, you know, this, this is your sister that you're seeing it in, in front of you fall, you see her fall about 100 feet, you're seeing this happen in real time. I know that you have a military background, you have a lot of experience on the mountains, as does she. What's your first instinct? What's your first sort of like, thought at that point? Yeah, the first thought was, let's, I mean, it was, let's stay calm. Um, let's assess the situation. And as soon as, and really it was like, 
we need to get ready to spend the night because mm -hmm. we're in a very precarious situation. So, um, again, I knew what they're kind of, you know, kind of blow by blow, but, but my main thing is like, we've got to retain all body heat. And so immediately try to put the, you know, puff or puffy jacket, um, puffy pants, rain pants over that to protect, to, to keep the heat in, um, another raincoat over her puffy jacket. I put my stuff on, um, and, and also eventually, and this isn't in order of sequence, but I mean, that was one of that, my first thought, like we're in terrain like this, we're not probably self extracting out of here. Right. Mm -hmm. And so we need to, we need to be ready to, to spend the night. Um, so the other piece was like, how bad is this injury? So there was, so it was, um, there was, uh, bleeding. It wasn't tremendous bleeding. So, so that was good, but we still had a quick clot and pressure dressing. So, so, uh, wrapped her up in that. Um, and then fortune. And so also, um, calling for the rescue. So I used this two way texting device, this somewhere to, um, uh, text my wife to say call for a rescue uh and so sarah uh wrote back that she was on it and started contacting uh the authorities so um we also were fortunate that about this time as all this is happening we moved here kind of crawled along to a bit of a safer spot okay. and um we heard some voices and there were some climbers coming down off the north ridge and it actually wow. turned out there were three teams of two people and they had all been kind of on the route together. So they kind of were, they kind of knew each other anyway. So they came over eventually and then were very helpful and kind of stabilizing the situation. They had some extra sleeping bags. So we kept wow. here warm. And so, um, again, just to kind of, you know, I can go into more detail, but, but ultimately what happened is the Navy, uh, picked up the call and uh, a Navy, Navy uh, search and rescue unit came in with um, a Seahawk helicopter, uh, two guys repelled out um, and uh, brought a litter, packaged Kira up, and then five and a half hours later, they were hoisting her up and taking her to Harborview for, uh, Medical Center. I... Have you ever been in a situation like this before? I haven't. Was it after the point that she falls and you, I mean, I'm already like, how do you find the line to her? Right. So you're, if you're on sort of a, uh, a, a tracked switchback up to the top of Mount Stewart, do you, you basically make your own line down to her at this point, right? How do you navigate that? And how do you navigate the time? So that's kind of my big question is that that five and a half hours between assessment and extraction, what's going through your head? What's going through her head? Is there a lot of calming? Is it, it, is she handling it well? I mean, I, I, I can only imagine what I would be doing in this situation. Um, obviously, you're far more experienced than I am, but I'm just really curious as to what's kind of going through everyone's heads during that five and a half hours. Yeah, yeah, it's it's uh it's hard. The um yeah, my I mean my immediate goal was I need to get down to her safely and we right. it was a very it was a very steep slope so I mean I immediately, you know, turned and you know, I was front pointing and and descending carefully, but it was hard because I mean I wanted to just, you know, kind of glissade down to her, but I yeah. knew that, that was that was not smart, but it was this you know, I mean just very um, uh, the, um, there was the tension between how fast do I get down to, to her and how safely can I do that? So it was, it was, you know, um, it was scary because I was worried about, you know, slipping myself. So anyway, so, but that's why I think I made a good decision and, and descended, you know, I, I didn't rush to failure. I use that term all the time. So I got sure. down to her, uh, safely. And then, and then, you know, thankfully my sister's one tough cookie and she was, um, very calm through the whole situation and, mm -hmm. you know, was apologizing the whole time, which is classic uh -huh. here, you know, and, um, but, uh, but she was, 
she was extremely calm and, and composed the whole time. It was never, it never went into shock. Um, mm -hmm. and was, was, you know, you know, very with it the whole time. It helped tremendously once these other climbers came over, specifically, um, again, in William and Brent, you know, we know each other pretty well. Um, they, uh, basically William came over and spent the whole time with Kier just talking to her, asking her questions and, you know, was just like really her, um, uh, was really focused on Kier, just making sure she was okay while I was trying to coordinate the rescue. And then ultimately like I'm texting back and forth with the helicopter, the medic on the helicopter, you know, about and taking videos of kind of the location because where we were was, it was very steep. And so I was actually worried if the helicopter would be able to get over far enough right. to actually drop a hoist down because of just the clearance of the blades. Like it was just that steep. And so, um, so I'm trying to coordinate all these things. And then, um, and the other climbers were also helpful. It turned out two, two of them were, had their woof, woofer certification, wilderness first aid. And then another one was a nurse. So we had like tremendous support. So they came mm -hmm. over, assessed the injury. You know, we had it wrapped up. We, um, uh, and like I said, it was, it was broken pretty severely with a lot of tendon, you know, damage. Um, and the cut, um, was, I don't know if that happened on the rock or whatever, but anyway, we had, we had the, the bleeding stopped, but anyway, they were very helpful in making sure that, you know, that cure from a medical standpoint was okay. So we were fortunate in that respect. You make the call, you get the Navy chopper comes in five and a half hours later. There's some video on again on Gavin's Instagram. That's there's great. There's great photos and videos that sort of document to, this and to give perspective. of Yeah where they were kind of hunkered down. The too. location is circled and it. I mean, you look at the <laughs> the sheer level of this, uh, uh, not a cliff, because I think it's the wrong term, but coal, it's coal essentially, right? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a permanent snow field. So, I mean, it's it was, it, it was a, um, yeah, it's a, it's a steep slope. I mean, I've, I've, I've skied it before, um, obviously with a, a lot more snow on it, but, um, you know, and, and even the, the other climbers are like, oh, if we had, you know, uh, just because the other, the alternate was the, was the crappy rock. And so, right. you know, these other climbers are like, oh yeah, if we had, you know, crampons and ice ice, we'll definitely take, the, definitely take the snow just because it's honestly for, for me, you know, it feels like I'm in more control, um, on, on snow. So, but now I just need to kind of reassess that. I mean, maybe staying on rock is better. So, I mean, there's still a lot of things that I, I still need to process, but, um, but anyway, that was the decision, you know, that we made to ascend the snow, but it wasn't, you know, I don't think it was a, um, a, uh, a, 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 a bad decision. I think we would have made that same decision, but yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's a risky situation. I mean, you know, anytime we go into the mountains, and especially in the steep terrain, you know, you're taking a level of risk. Is there anything that you've pulled from this? I mean, again, this happened a week ago. Very this is fresh. all very fresh. I know that. And I don't know how many times you've even been able to talk through it in, in its entirety. But it's one of those things where I, from an outsider's perspective, sort of read the posts and saw the pictures and saw your explanations <laughs> of how it went down. And, you know, I have a I have a hard enough time just getting like, through certain mountain terrain without fearing like, Oh, I'm going to fall or uh, the candle catwalk to me gives me pause because there's yeah. sheer edges and stuff. But totally for, for someone who is this experience and who does experience this sort of thing, did you pull anything? Did you learn anything in the last few days or have you even been able to look at it as a, as an experience that you can draw something from or provide um, feedback to anyone who may attempt sorts of these sorts of backcountry adventures in the future? Yeah, like I said, I, I mean, I still haven't, uh, you know, I think fully processed it. I, 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 I think, I, I mean, I'm, I'm uh, glad that I, you know, we were prepared with enough gear. You know, I think I talked about this that, you know, we were like, I'm always ready to spend the night. And I mean, I've carried a lot of overnight gear for many years and never used it. And so I'm glad that I didn't get complacent and be like, oh, this is just, you know, kind of a day thing and we'll just, you know, be out of here. So 
the big takeaway for me is like, you know, that extra weight is so worth it because when things go wrong, you definitely want it. So, I mean, we were, you know, we would, it would have been a cold night, but we would have been okay. You know, the other thing was looking at the weather window, you know, and, and, um, and we had bomber, bomber weather, but it's not guaranteed. I mean, just like back Caitlin and Alex, what they were talking about, you know, they thought they had bomber weather on the infinity loop and didn't, you know, it wasn't. Um, and, but they made a smart decision to bail and, or, you know, bail off the second summit. So, um, so I think that's the big takeaway is just the reinforcement that being ready to spend the night in the mountains is, um, is, you know, it's, it's worth carrying the extra weight. Um, as far as, you know, the route choice, I mean, I think I would have done the same thing. Yeah. You know, I'm just, uh, so, um, so yeah, I think those are some of the things I've been thinking about it. I mean, in the very few limited of scramble experiences that I've had with, with young mountains where the rock is still crumbling and it's still changing. And especially up here in the Northwest or in California, like if you're on a, if you're on a rock surface, that's not solid. Uh, it's not great. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's not scary. quite reassuring. So I can, I can totally imagine, I haven't done Mount Stewart, but I can totally imagine what you're facing here is like uh, a pretty legit snow field where I know I can get grip. I got crampons. I got the ice gear or a less than stellar rock route like that to me, of course, snow, you're going to have more confidence in the snow. So pushing forward here a little bit, I know that uh, with the evac um, on a, on a Navy copter, did you all, did you and Kira get evac or did she get evac and you had to make your way down? Did you go with the climbers and the mountaineers? Yeah. So we, um, yeah, Kira had a, had a, uh, got the ride to Harbor view, which, um, yeah, so, okay. so we had to walk out. And okay. so the decision was made that we needed to get, um, basically out of the area while the chopper came in, because when the chopper initially came in, to the, the two Navy guys, um, rappelled down. And also I should just put a plug in that it's going to be hard for me to talk smack about the Navy now. So I went to West Point <laughs> and there's a big rivalry with the Navy, obviously with football, but, um, but these were two good dudes. So, so I, I like, I like the Navy. <laughs> um, but they, uh, yeah, so they, they rappelled down and then, uh, one with a litter and then we actually had rigged ropes up and we actually, uh, pulled the litter or I didn't, mm. but the, the, the couple guys were, uh, pulling the litter up, which was helpful. It saved some time, but we needed to get out of the area because when the chopper was going to come in next, it was going to drop the hoist straight down. And there were just a, there's a bunch of just, again, all this kitty litter and loose rock everywhere that we were worried about that stuff blowing on top of us. Some of the prop um, wash. Yeah, just because, you know, there's tremendous prop wash. So we needed to get out of there anyway, and it was getting dark. So oh. the chopper didn't actually come in until 9 p.m., so did the extraction all at night, wow. um, which, was, which was pretty wild. So we're descending, starting to descend the Cascadian and um, see the chopper come in. And then I see, I was looking, I kept looking back, and I saw just this like light bouncing around and I, that was cure getting hoisted up in the, uh, in the litter, which, you know, felt, um, it was a, a lot of relief, you know, to, to see the chopper take off. I can't imagine. Yeah. I, I, it sounds like you had to, to, to evacuate the area. You had to leave her with, did they drop a, the two Navy guys and were they able to stay with her while the, yeah, they were with her. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So in the litter, they packaged her up. So they were with, they were with her and, uh, but it was hard, definitely hard to leave her side, oh, you know, I can only imagine. Um, so, um, so yeah, then we'd be kind of down the long, I mean, it took us, I think three and a half or four hours to walk out and it's just, I mean, the Cascadian is just nasty to begin with. And then, you know, then with all of this other stuff happening, but I was very thankful to go out with Brent and William. I mean, they'd been, I mean, these guys were amazing. I mean, they, um, had just climbed out steward. They thought it was going to take them a day. It took them two days. They'd had wow. like four cliff bars were, <laughs> and these guys, I mean, I mean, again, just how selfless they were. I mean, this was like after cures, like packaged up, you know, everything's like ready to go. We're just waiting for the chopper. They're like, Hey, do you guys have any food? 
Like we haven't, uh-huh. we haven't eaten in like 10 hours or something. I'm like, yeah, I haven't cut up food. <laughs> and so, um, I mean, just, you know, so yeah, they were like and scarfing down the food. They were so hungry, but it just showed how selfless they were, wow. you know, not yeah. thinking about themselves during, while they, while they helped us out. I, uh, I know that there's another facet to the story that your sister Kier got evac to the hospital that her husband was working at. And that's part of the story that I think was just uh, really interesting to read that reading his encounter, his encounter with the call and the person being brought in was in fact his wife. And it's such an interesting story. And again, I know that this is all uh, processing this in real time and sort of learning, learning more details of the story and sort of how it played out for you, Gavin is, is one side of it. And I know that your sister is recovering. Um, has she been released? Is she mobile? Is she moving around? Is her ankle have good, is her good diagnosis, basically? Prognosis. prognosis. Uh, yeah. So, um, so yeah, just like you said, I mean, the, like the timing of this is kind of insane because it was John, her husband's last night as on the floor of the, of the, of the, you know, trauma, um, room. And so this was, yeah, like, that was his last night. It was going to peace out and they were going to move to Michigan. So John's taking a, um, he's going to be a professor at Michigan or in, 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 um, the, uh, yeah. So they're, they're moving to Michigan and, and they were moving out. So it was his last night, Sunday night. And then they were moving out of their apartment Tuesday. And then they were going to stay with us for a, a week and a half. And then Kira was going to run Bigfoot and then be off. That was going to be her last big adventure before, you know, they move, move. So, um, so it was just crazy timing that, yeah, his last night there, Kira comes in and then, um, you know, Kira had surgery. Luckily the prognosis is, is very good. I mean, we're, okay. they're surrounded with tons of great, um, folks in both the athletic community, um, and the, in the medical community. So, so that's great. And here, you know, she's, she, uh, they got this like, uh, scooter thing, but it's like an all terrain scooter. So it's got like, big tires. it's like the fat tire version of, of these scooters. And so she just like, I think just scooted a five, like a 5k. So it's funny because on Strava, she marked it as a run, but I'm not sure. <laughs> is it technically a run with one leg? That's right. Right. That's right. I'll go flag. Pushing. I'll flag and that two run. Two wheels. Yeah. Yeah. Kim's going to go flag it. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. So it's, um, but you know, I mean, to, to be honest, it's going to be a long road for Kier. And, and I just, you know, I hope that she, you know, doesn't push it too hard, too fast. And, mm-hmm. you know, to put it in perspective, I mean, she ran twice as many miles as I did last year. You know, she runs wow. all the time. Like I kind of run to kind of, you know, cruise around the mountains but you know she just loves running every every single day so this is going to be challenging it, mm. for her but but I'm you know we're thankful that she you know it, the fall wasn't any worse that she does have good prospects for recovery and I think it now it's just an ant, but you know, they're also, I mean, they just moved to Michigan and she's figuring out how to be in this new house and then yeah, so it's just been absolutely insane. I mean, I'm, it's great to hear that she's okay. I know that you posted the the photo of kind of a, a wider shot where she was tucked under the rock and how it could have been very different. Um, and it wasn't, and she's okay. And, and you're okay. And everyone's um, moving on from it, but it's still one of those things where I can only imagine how powerful it is for you. Would you approach the mountains any differently? Are you would you approach your adventures any differently? Is there anything that you're taking from this that will change anything you do in the future? Yeah, I, I mean, I just, it's a reinforcement that the mountains are a, a dangerous place. And, you know, I've, you know, been fortunate to have surrounded myself with people who, you know, do respect the mountains. And Kira and I did respect the mountain. We took all the appropriate <laughs> gear and chose the right line. But, it, you know, sometimes just things happen and you need to be prepared to deal with them. So, um, you know, I, I, I guess I don't have, yeah, some grand 
um, you know, take away, but I mean, I want to continue going in the mountains. I mean, I yeah. want to continue adventuring with my sister, with my wife, with my kids. I mean, you know, it's like we go in the mountains because, you know, the, you know, the enjoyment that they provide, you know, just being in those, these awesome wild spaces, but, um, but it comes with, with that risk. So, um, you know, I, I, yeah, I want to, um, I definitely want to, um, you know, keep going out, but, but we are just, you know, at Beacon Rock, then the next weekend to this 50 K and we hiked up, um, the switchbacks going up Beacon Rock for yeah. people who know it's like 52 switchbacks and you climb up and, and it's like, there's huge drop-offs and, you know, and all kinds of people are out there cruising and, you know, and it's safe. But like our kids, I could just tell I was like super hyper aware of, mm. you know, them not, you know, I was just very kind of uh, skittish. Um, so, you know, that'll, you know, and, and, and that's the thing, like you want to have a healthy fear, you know, the pot, the positive power and aid of thinking, you know, it just goes back to that. So, you know, I don't want to lose sight of that. And so, you know, sometimes these things are just meant to reinforce that we need to the mountains are big and they don't care. Right. You just need to, you need to respect them. I, uh, I, one really appreciate you sharing this story because I know that it's probably still being processed by you and your family and, and everyone. And I think it's good to talk about these things for those who maybe are not necessarily as experienced in the back country, or even those who are experienced in the back country, that these sorts of things can happen to anybody and to just to be prepared and to pack those things that you never use for 10 years, but then that one day you might need it. Um, I don't know. I feel like there's lots of lessons just being able to hear your story and hear you talk about it that I can pull for our adventures, mm -hmm. you know, our every day, our every weekend sort of long uh, outings in the mountains and stuff like that. But um, before we wrap up, of course, I, I want to talk about Fat Dog. I know that that was something <laughs> that you just did this weekend. And did you have to have a conversation with Kier of like, listen, I love you. I am going to run fat dog this weekend. <laughs> uh, what was sort of your mind? Where was your mind when you were like, I need to get something. I need to get some long run in. Yeah. Yeah. That was, that was a tricky s situation because yeah, she'd gone through all of this and, you know, wanted to, you know, she, and she, yeah, really wanted to be at Bigfoot and, mm. and, um, so, yeah, so I said, Hey, I'm, you know, I'm thinking about doing this thing. What do you think? And, you know, just cure being so gracious. She was like, Oh yeah, you know, I totally support that. So, you know, and she was texting me, you know, so much about how she, you know, just thought, you know, was going to be thinking about me and I was thinking about her out there. So, you know, we have a pretty good, good bond. And, um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, grateful I got to go, go out there and experience the course. Yeah. It's a, it's a, like you said earlier, it's a, um, it's a new course and it, and it's, it's very hard. It has like, they had to reroute some things due to the fire that you mentioned last year. And that, that terrain is still closed off and the trails are closed and stuff like that. How did it meet your expectations or did it, throw you for a loop because some of the pictures that i'm seeing are just i've never seen these peaks and it's like whoa that i can't believe they would go up and over these peaks and these ridge lines and was it yeah. the experience you would expect and yeah, was it, it a was, good training for ptl yeah it was a, it was a kick in the pants at the at the <laughs> end because we did this thing called frosty which hadn't been been part of the course before and then skyline and and you're kind of cruising up this almost kind of like a you know a wide a pretty wide trail and it's just, it's super mellow and it's just like ascends, ascends, ascends. And I just thought it was just going to kind of like pop over this ridge and then we descend down to the lake. Um, and it just kept going and going. And then you turn this corner and you look up and it's just this big rocky scramble. <sighs> and I was looking and I could see this little like fluorescent yellow dot and it was a dude. He, I mean, it was, he was that far <laughs> away. I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> and this was, you know, a hundred and, I don't know, five miles into it or something. And uh, so I was like, I can't really believe that they put this as part of the course. And especially the people that did that thing at night. 
like, oh my gosh, this is this is pretty brutal. Because there were places you did not want to fall. Um, yeah. It was pretty pretty scrambly. So anyway, so that was that was tough. And then what had been part of the course before was this last peak called Skyline. And uh, honestly, I just kind of underestimated. People had talked about how there were these false summits. Like just when you think you're at the top, there's like more. And I figured there'd be like, oh, I don't know, like three. There were like eight. <laughs> like really <laughs> and then my foot was all blistered up so that kind of hurt and then um so i was just kind of ready to be done but uh but yeah it was <laughs> it was um it was it was very stiff i don't know what how things ended up like you know, finishing rate and things like that but um but you have 49 hours it used to be 48 to extend it to 49 hours to complete the whole thing and if you finish it under 36 hours you get a like a colored buckle and so they kind of have these two different cat or, you know, um, yeah, buckles. Uh, I think you can tell by the thumbnail of this show that <laughs> Gavin did get a colored buckle, which is pretty cool. Uh, big shout out to uh, Avery Collins, who ran it in 25 something, even going off course. And uh, I mm. can't imagine what you've been doing back to back to back to back, like that adventure in Cascade, plus the evac and your sister and then going into beacon rock and then into this, yeah, it's not just only like physically taxing, but also emotionally. emotionally yeah, too. for sure. Um, before I, I ask some of the final questions here to wrap up this show, we do have live questions. Uh, Kim, please. Yeah. There's a great question from Ingen in the chat room. We mentioned before Gavin is a father of like some very adorable kids. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, Ingen says, uh, how much do the kids know about what happened? I'm trying to balance teaching my kids mm. to have a healthy respect for the mountains, but also not freaking them out. Yeah, they, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, they know. Um, I mean, well, they, Kieran and John slept on our couch <laughs> for the next, uh, you know, week or so until they, until they left. For Michigan, so yeah, they they knew what happened. I mean, not the not the details, but you know, as far as the the you know the all the details of the accident. But they know that yeah, Kira was in the mountains climbing, and yeah, I mean, we you know we we're yeah trying to expose them to lots of different things. I mean, we've been I think camping every other weekend with them, and we went doing it on the canoe and did a canoe camping trip and. We mountain bike a lot. And so, you know, we're trying to just have them, yeah, have, you know, just a love of the outdoors. And, um, and, and we haven't done like technical stuff with them. I mean, we did, you know, some rock climbing and things like that, but, you know, we're just in due time. I mean, I didn't get into this stuff until I was, you know, I mean, I didn't rock climb until I was in college and I didn't run my first marathon until college. You know, I've been kind of a late, latecomer to all of this stuff and so you know there's no rush to have them go climb big mountains or anything like that i just want them to have fun in the outdoors i again like just following you and and seeing what you're doing with your kids and exposing them to the outdoors and camping like you said every other weekend is such a cool thing to see you know, my parents raised me in the outdoors and, and going camping every Same. summer, all like yeah. every weekend in the summer. And it was one of those things that I cherish now as an adult, being able to look back and go, wow, I'm That's so how I spent my summer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> how fortunate yeah. was I? So, I mean, Gavin, let this as someone who was once a kid, uh, <laughs> let me tell you what you're doing with them now is it's going to come back 20 years from now and it's going to change like going to change their lives like it's such a cool thing to see you do that as a as a mom and pop you know but it's guess. also a really cool thing really to observe thing. obviously we don't have kids but it's cool to see um you guys both you and your wife just kind of do this and as an outsider looking in it's like yeah that is possible like you're working you're adventuring you're raising these two fantastic children and taking them on all these incredible places and yeah yeah no i'm i'm i mean the best decision i ever made was to marry sarah for sure, because she's, you know, my partner, she's been, you know, my adventure partner and now, you know, such a great mom and, you know, that she's up for these things, honestly, you know, and it's kids kind of, you know, nonstop and, you know, like it's a lot of logistics and just having, you know, just moving stuff in and out of the car. And, but we just, you know, I think we feel like 
you know, especially in the summer here, there's just like such limited time and just like, we're just going to go yeah. get after it as much as possible. So I'm so thankful that she's, she's up for that. <laughs> and she also does her own races. I mean, she, she's a ultra runner and she adventures a lot on her own. Do you guys have to balance like taking care of the kids or do you have great babysitters on, yeah. on Rolodex? And, uh, yeah, maybe the second best decision we ever made was uh, to have her mom uh, move her up from California up here. And uh, so she's helped out with the kids. But we try to take her. I mean, we, like we like Beacon Rock. Like So uh, Benita sat in the very cramped space in the back of the car car um <laughs> and amongst all of our camping mm. gear and um and so then she watched the kids while sarah and i both ran the 50k so i mean we try not to just like oh well let's just leave the kids at home you know mm. we want to bring them out as as much as possible but we're also trying to do our our own stuff too like we yeah one night we went out into this kind of dusk patrol you know just up the i-90 corridor corridor which was which was super fun just to have kind of a you know a date night up there so, um, so yeah, we're trying to, trying to balance it all. And, um, and then, yeah, it's trying to support Sarah more. Honestly, you know, she supported me so much with just as once our daughter is seven and our son is four and a half. And when, as soon as our daughter was born, you know, I, my, it was kind of this time when my ultra, I wouldn't say career because I'm just kind of still a weekend warrior. Here, but you know, was as I started doing West, you know, did UTMB in Western states, and then you know, Badwater, and you know, like on, on all these races. But it was really starting to pick up, and right. and she was super supportive. And so now I've really tried to be more supportive of her as she goes out and you know does these longer runs. It's again, man, you you may not realize your influence on others. Uh, it's it's there. Like Kim and I look at you and look at Sarah and look at your family and your adventures and what you guys are able to do. And it's super inspiring. I know that's really weird to say. I know we have met in person a number of times, but it's also like, well, thanks. you don't know how often your name is brought up in this house or on this show of just like, man, Kevin's just crushing it. And like, look at all these things he's doing in his family. Like, how cool is that? Um, so thank you for well, thank being you. open with all of these things. And thank you, especially tonight, for being open with the recent adventures, because, you know, I know viewers and listeners will benefit from hearing this sort of thing um, and learning from it and learning from what you and your experience and your uh, expertise has to bring to the table. So thank you, Gavin. Really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you, guys. And congratulations on Fat Dog, too. Uh, I know that we've barely <laughs> touched on what was oh, how many hours was it? Thirty two hours. Yeah, and yeah, a little under 33. So it's a good training run. <laughs> I love it. Uh, good training run for Gavin because he's training for PTL. And, well, yeah, uh, I mean, it, it was, yeah, it was good endurance training. So, I mean, the other thing is like my, I probably, so I started a new job about, a, 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 well, 11 months ago or whatever. And so, and I like to jump into these situations, which are just like kind of chaotic. So I, I lead a, a division here at Porch. We help people find experts to come in and like home improvement experts. Um, but, but my division where, um, we help uh, people as they move into homes. Mm -hmm. And so building a big team and I have a big team in Dallas. And, and so I had just flown in Thursday morning. So I was in Dallas Thursday morning, woke up like two 30 in the morning and then got in and then drove up to Canada um, and then started the race on Friday. So it was, it was just an endurance event, just getting <laughs> Getting wow. there. And so, um, so anyway, I'm just thankful that I pulled this thing off because, uh, yeah, but I, I don't know. I just like, why not? You know, just like, just like do it. There's no time like the present. Literally sucking the marrow out of life. Like I love it. <laughs> you know, this is a testament to you sleep when you're dead, you know, like yeah. just do it, do the things that you really want to do and, and get the most out of the time. Um, our guest tonight, Gavin Woody, is someone to follow, someone to to keep track of. PTL is coming up, obviously, in a couple of weeks. That'll be really fun to track Gavin and his progress there. Um, Gavin, where can people find you on social media? Where can they follow up if they have residual questions or they kind of want to see these photos and videos as they played out uh, over the last few weeks? Where can they find you? Just Facebook and Instagram. Just pictures of no politics, just adventures and kids. So, you're into those things. It's every, cats every once in a while. 
<laughs> uh, it's at Gavin Woody on Instagram. Uh, definitely worth the follow. It'll inspire you to get out and challenge yourself because every once in a while, he'll go run 15 repeats of Tiger Mountain <laughs> and make you go, wait, maybe I could do that. And then realize, or also nope. maybe you go, you shouldn't be complaining about doing one. <laughs> one. Yeah, every time that we go out and do a hard run or something, I go, oh, Gavin's probably done this like 20 times <laughs> just this morning alone. Uh, worth the follow will certainly inspire all of you. So thanks once again to our guest tonight, Gavin Woody. Uh, we're going to move into our after show here. We're going to keep Gavin for just a couple more minutes. Gavin, do you have the time for our after show just a little bit? Sure. Cool. Uh, so for those of you who would like to join us in our after show, it's quite easy to do. All you got to do is go to patreon.com slash the ginger runner for as little as a dollar a month. You get access to all of our after shows. That's the uh, the time that we spend after our main podcast. We get to ask the residual questions of our guests. Um, all you got to do is go to patreon.com slash the ginger runner. That's it. You get access to tonight's previous and future after shows. A lot of fun. Um, GRGR registration, Ginger Runner Global Run. That is now officially open. If you would like to register for our fourth annual global run, all you got to do is go to rungrgr.com. Uh, we got the t-shirt option, the digital option. We are looking forward to this year. We're working with Territory Run Company. The t-shirts are yes. going to be awesome. Um, very, very excited because this is our fourth time doing it. And every year it gets bigger and better and more people from around the globe uh, take part. The event itself will be on October 13th. Uh, all the details can be found at rungrgr.com. So definitely check that out and join us. We'd love to have you. Um, and finally, at the end of every episode, we like to highlight a member of our community who does something. Oh, yeah. Okay. I don't know what it sounds like. It's harps. Oh. Harp, harp noises. Um, we like to recognize a member of our community who's gone above and beyond or pushed their limits, uh, busted through a wall or a challenge. And uh, we call it our GR crew member of the week. So I'm very excited about this. Let's do the harps. There we go. Uh, <laughs> Kim, who is our GR crew member of the week? Yeah, this week's GR crew member of the week is Peter Edwards. Uh, Peter says on the Ginger Runner Patreon Facebook page. Facebook page yeah. <laughs> took me a minute. Uh, Peter says, pretty awesome week over here. Broke the 70 pounds lost mark hey. and hit my first 20 mile week and cut the time it takes to go up and down our little local ski hill in half. This genuinely is starting to not suck. <laughs> I love it. Congratulations on all your accomplishments, Peter. You're doing awesome. You're doing awesome, Peter. <laughs> Big congrats to you. Uh, so thank you for being our GR crew member of the week. We love to highlight people who are in the midst of their journeys, no matter where it is and uh, no matter where they are. Thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in to Ginger Runner Live, episode number 271 with Gavin Woody. Uh, we're going to move into the after show. Get out there, train hard, race harder, and party the hardest. I know I am. Kim, anything? Never forget. I don't think so. Sweet. We'll see you guys next week. Bye. Ginger.